being still doesn't mean you don't care. Um, in, in, the, in the presence of evil, in the presence of the invasion of evil and darkness, doesn't mean that you don't care. It means you know that God cares. It means you know that He is strong. It means that you're resting in, in His care and in His love. Amen? Anybody else need their blood pressure to come down just a little bit these days? That might be one of the keys. Plus, probably a little less caffeine would help too, but um, hmm. keep praying. Keep praying. And I want to ask you to turn to Psalm 56, please, tonight. I've got two of them up here for you, Psalm 56 and Psalm 57, back to back. I want to read both of them and, and uh, one by one. Great songs. Uh, I don't know if you're a poet or have ever <laughs> played around with poetry or, you know, songwriting. And I heard a, a, an old uh, Paul Simon song to, uh, a couple of days ago, and I thought, oh, I wish I would have written that. Oh, I want to write something that's that good. And it doesn't matter which one it is. It's just something that's, a lot of Paul Simon songs, a lot of Dylan songs, I remember thinking, man, I, I like the way that sounds, but I don't have any idea what that means. You know, words that are just kind of jammed together, but they sound good. But when I read these psalms, and, and both of these are songs of David, it's, oh, you know, I feel like there's, there's the situations I've been through that I could have written something like that. In, in fact, it's a, you know, a song like, and I want to show you this quote, it's from C.S. Lewis. He said that uh, we read to know that we are not alone. And a lot of times, when you, how many of you, when you've read a book, it's like, oh, I feel the same way. I felt the same way. How many of you, when you read scripture and you read some of these songs, you think, oh, I feel the same way. Oh, the Lord is my shepherd. I got all that I need. You know, oh, I feel the same way. And you read these beautiful, beautiful uh, poems and songs in scripture, some of which I don't know they were ever really put to music because I can't imagine singing in a song some of those, those more, uh, oh God, would you just go get that person and break their teeth in their mouth? I can't imagine singing that on a Sunday morning. But anyway. You, you, I, I think when we read through the Psalms, it, it lets us know we're not the first ones to feel that way. And there's a beautiful thing, too, that another last little bit of encouragement I want to give you. Right now, at this point in our, um, th this, this phase that we're at in the Refuge School of Prayer, I want to ask you to, um, to enlist somebody else as a prayer partner, and maybe more than one. Just, uh, I want you to get a name of somebody how many of you, when I say that to you, there's, there's a name or a face that comes to mind right away? Just either say, yeah, yeah, or raise your hand, yeah. Well, if you haven't already, write them, call them, text them, or if they're sitting beside you, say it's you. And, uh, and sometime in the next day or so, get a hold of that person and say, would you like to pray? Would you like to pray with me? And the first thing they'll think is, oh, why, what did I do? What's wrong? What'd you catch? And he said, no, 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 no. I just, I, I, I want a brother or a sister that I can pray with. And, uh, and uh, husbands and wives, if that other person is not your husband or wife, then men, make it a man. Women, make it a woman. And, and just say to another person, and by the way, if you are married, husbands and wife, be a prayer team. But then I think you need somebody else along, you know, uh, uh, you know along with that. The brother, another brother, you can say, hey, can we get together and pray? And just build some prayer teams like that. And, and just, you know, you come together, and I think God will give you the agenda. He'll give you the prayer list. How many of you agree with that? Amen? He'll, he'll tell you what to pray about, because I think he's looking for people that will pray. So I, I agree with what C.S. Lewis said, that we do read. We read to know that we're not alone. And, and we read a lot. You know, have you noticed that bookstores are still around and we don't all want to read. How many of you would prefer to read on paper in a real book rather than uh, digital? How many of you would prefer the digital? You know, and I do like to, how compact that is when you're traveling to not have to take a big heavy book with you. But uh, <coughs> we read a lot. But did you know the Bible is still the number one bestseller? Anybody know approximately how many Bibles have been sold? What was that? A gazillion. I'm not sure what a gazillion is, <laughs> but way more than any other book. It's over, let me show you here, um, over, uh, that's quotations of Chairman Mao. That's not what I'm talking about. So over six point something billion Bibles have been sold. 
The next closest is the quotations of Chairman Mao, 800 million. Look at, look at this list. The Quran, about 800 million. A Harry Potter series. Can you believe that? Underneath those other two, I guess, I've never read them. I, I guess from what I saw today, there's about seven volumes together. She is the, J.K. Rowling is the, the most successful author on planet Earth today. 447 million. Uh, I'm not sure how to pronounce that, but a Chinese dictionary, Jinhua, I guess, 400 million. The Lord of the Rings, 150 million. Uh, Book of Mormon, 120 million. There, then there were none. I've never heard of the book. I've heard of Agatha Christie, but she sold over 100 million. The Da Vinci Code, 80 million. Catcher in the Rye, J.D. Salinger, 60 million. Ben Hur, 50 million. And then, yeah, you knew it would be on there somewhere. The Purpose Driven Life, with about 50 or 60 books between that, sold about 30 million. And most importantly, Who Moved My Cheese by Spencer Johnson, 26 million. <laughs> and then we go back to the Bible. But in a strange way, did you know that the Gospel According to Peanuts sold 10 million copies? But still at the top of the list of all the books ever written, take, take all of those that we just added up, and the Bible has sold more than all of them. Because people are hungry for truth. And, and in the scripture, when you come to that book, that in almost every version that includes the New Testament, you'll find the book of Psalms where? Right in the middle. Right in the middle. It's probably the most popular book in, in all of the Bible in, in terms of just around the world. Jews and Christians and people who don't really declare any faith, if they find the book, the Bible, in a nightstand, in a, in a, uh, you know, a hotel or a motel, they'll probably open it up and hit the Psalms before they hit anything else. It's those songs that speak to our heart. The Psalms let us know that we're not alone as well. That, that others have, have experienced every single human emotion that you've experienced. They've been hit, as we've just prayed, they've been hit by grief. They've been hit by pain. They've been hit by this sense of abandonment. You, you hear King David, King David, who wrote at least 75 of the 150 Psalms that we have in the book of Psalms. At least half of those were penned by David. And it's David who says at one point, why have you forsaken me? He even goes further. He said, why are you so far from helping me? You felt that before. You felt, God, where are you? And David felt that. And that's, that's why when you open up the scripture and you see David feeling that way, but still saying, God, I'm, I'm, at least I'm saying it to you. Even if I don't happen to hear you speaking to me any sweet words right now, and you're going to hear from me. And, and the promise that he made, as long as I live, I will pray to you. He kept that promise. Even if sometimes his prayers were what, what you'd have to call complaints. It seems like David used his songs like a journal of his life. And, and I have to say this. I doubt that David knew that his songs, <laughs> all 75 plus whatever else he wrote, I doubt that he knew that his songs would make it into a book that would sell 6.5 billion copies, along with his story, his, his biography. He was just writing to express to God how he was feeling. But there, there they are. And when we start to, to move through the Psalms, you, you begin to discover that you're not alone in the peaks and the valleys of life. There's days when, when, when you're standing on one of those peaks of those beautiful, beautiful psalms and you're crying out just like David saying, oh God, you're so wonderful to me. And all you have to say to him is praise. And all you have to say is how wonderful he is. And like the Psalm 23 and Psalm 21 are psalms like that. But then there's those other psalms where you're saying just like David did, oh Lord, how will this turn out? And I want to look at Psalm 56 and 57 in that, in that light tonight. You, you're going to go through peaks like David went through. Peaks like the, the one that some of you are on tonight. Those moments where you think, oh, it's, it's, it's all good. How, how many of you have moments like that where you think, it's all good? He said, wow, this is a great moment in life. We were driving down to the wedding the other day, down in, in Dana Point, 
And I had one of those little, those strange moments where we're just, we're driving down, I can't remember, Crown Valley or one of those to, to get to the wedding. And just for a few moments, not that there was deep depression on either side, but there was just this, God, you're so good. And it, was, it put a smile on my face and it was like, wow, all is well, all is good. And then all fell, no, it didn't all fall apart. But there's times when you think, where did that go? But uh, there's times, the peaks like the one you're on now, or maybe the valley like you're in right now, or the storms like the one that you're going through. Well, David's Psalms show us how to pray through the storms. And I want to encourage you, if you haven't done this, to pray through the Psalms. As you're, most of them are prayers. They're directed to God. And as you read through them, sort of in a, in, a, in a meditative way, where your meditation just means think deeply, focused way, think deeply on what you're reading, it's like a prayer book. And it will change the vocabulary of your prayer. It, 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 if anybody's like me, you know, you sit down just with an, an unwritten list in your head, like, oh, I know I got to pray for the, you know, all of these different names, and I work, you know, through joy and the kids and their spouses and our grandkids, and then, okay, what do I say now? Well, this, the Psalms will give you vocabulary for your prayer. It'll take you off in new directions to pray things in a very, would you agree, biblical way. As you pray, what you find right there in the Bible. So I suggest that you pray your way through the Psalms. And not just all the good ones. Pray your way through the ones that are tough too. So Psalm 56. I just want to read through this. And, um, and as we're reading through, I, I want you to think about this. I want to drop this little thought on you. I want you to work on your will. How many of you have a will? I don't really care what's in your will, but anybody have a will? Have you thought about it? It's a different will that I'm talking about. I'm not talking about your last will and testament, and I'll explain in a second. Listen to, as I read Psalm 56 to you, the number of times you hear the word, I will, or the word will. David, it says, it's to, set to, and this must have been a tune, the silent dove in distant lands. Doesn't that sound like a sweet song? a miktam of David when the Philistines captured him in Gath. So it may be like a minor key in his mind, but he says, be merciful to me, O God, for man would swallow me up. So there's trouble. Fighting all day, he oppresses me. My enemies would hound me all day. There are many who fight against me, O Most High. Whenever I'm afraid, I will trust in you. In God, I will praise his word. In God, I have put my trust. I will not be afraid. I will not fear. What can flesh do to me? All day they twist my words. All their thoughts are against me for evil. They gather together, they hide, they mark my steps. And when they lie in wait for my life, shall they escape by iniquity in anger? Cast down the peoples, oh God. How many of you so far have said, I felt like that before? They're after me. Nobody here ever had an enemy? I felt like David there. And then have you ever felt like praying like David? In anger, cast them down, Lord. Just deal with them. Deal with the people that are against me. And he's hiding out in a cave in Gath. And then he says in verse 8, you number my wanderings. I love this. Put my tears into your bottle. Are they not in your book? When I cry out to you, then my enemies will turn back. This I know because God is for me. In God, I will praise his word. In the Lord, I will praise his word. In God, I have put my trust. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? That seems, sounds like it was maybe the chorus in that song that he kept coming back to. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? Well, David, they could kill you. Yeah, but then they're done. And then I'm home. I'm with the Lord. What can man do to me? Verse 12, he says, Vows made to you are binding upon me, O God. I will render praises to you. I love that. I will render praises to you. For you have delivered my soul from death. Have you not kept my feet from falling? That I may walk before God in the light of the living. There's a bunch of I wills in there, and there's one I may. And look up here on the screen and let's look at, at, at the wills that we've gathered. He said, I will trust you, Lord. David, who said, the scripture says, he's a man after God's own heart. It was spoken before the cave experience. He said, here I am in a cave, and all the enemies are trying to find me. I'm tucked away into the dark recesses of this cave. Anybody ever been in a cave? Not a lot of light in the cave. 
And here I am in the cave, Lord, but I will trust in you. And then down in verse 4 and verse 10, he says, I will praise your word. He says that three times. I will praise your word. That means I will speak highly of the scriptures. And I, obviously, I'll dwell upon them, and I'll, I'll love them, and I'll memorize them, and I'll feed upon them. And by the way, listen, if you're not doing that, then there's something else that's got your attention besides the Word of God. And if the Word of God doesn't get your attention, then all that other media and all that other text, aside from God's text to you, it will get your attention, and that will settle down into your heart, mind, soul, and that'll be the text that your heart, mind, and soul live to or live according to. But if you fill yourself with the Word of God and refuse to ever stop eating from the Scriptures, you're going to find yourself growing in strength, and you're going to find your heart, soul, and mind referring back to the text, the script. You all have a script. All of us have a script that we live to. I had a script that I lived to, lived according to long before I came to Christ, and it was a very worldly script with little text messages, long before there were text messages, that I just lived according to, little proverbs and, and little values and wretched little values that marked my life and defined my life. But David said, I will trust you and I will praise your word. He put it in, in such a high, exalted place in his life. Verse 4 and 11, he says it twice in here, I will not be afraid. How's your will going so far? Do you trust him? Do you praise his word? Do you refuse to be fearful? I will not fear. And you'd have to agree that David had lots of good reasons to be afraid, but he refused to be afraid. And then this one, in verse 12, I love this. I will render praise. Now, I don't know if the word render here means what, uh, what David meant, but I remember when we were putting together the, um, the building here. It was a great big empty box. There was a couple of places where there was, you know, the bathrooms were there in the middle with the second story above it, and there was another couple of storage rooms. The rest of it was just a wide open building. And we went to architects, and architects started drawing things, and they brought us their what? Their renderings. And some of the renderings, they were just blueprints, but some of the renderings were what they call elevations. They were, they were drawings of how beautiful the building would look when they were done. And so when I hear David say, I will render you praise, it's like I'm going to paint you just a beautiful, um, what, am I, what am I trying to say, Pick word picture in my praise, God. I will render you praise. I'll paint you a beautiful picture of praise. And then in verse 13, he says that I may walk, and he's saying, I will walk with God. In, you know, in other words, what he's saying, my life is not going to end in this cave. I trust in you. I'm going to praise you. I will not be afraid. I'm going to render you praise, and I'm going to walk out of this cave one day. That is so important to remember when, when you hit the dark cave, when you feel like you've been caverned in and you're stuck. To, to recognize it and to say it and to say it boldly, I'm going to walk out of this cave one day. This is not where it ends for me. This may be dark, it may be hard, but it doesn't end here. You see how easy it is to pray through a psalm like that? Now, I begin to read Psalm 56, and before I'm you know, much further than a half a line in, I, I said, oh, Lord, I felt that way. Be merciful to me, too. You were for David. Be merciful to me, and don't let my enemies swallow me up. Powerful. It's a beautiful, beautiful psalm. So let, let's work a little further on our will, okay? Let's go to, to Psalm 57. Look down here, it's Psalm 57. A little bit shorter psalm. And this says, set to do not destroy. I love, I love the titles on these ancient songs or melodies, whatever they were. Another mictem of David when he fled from Saul into the cave. So I don't know if these should be in, in reverse order or not. But he said, be merciful to me, O God. Be merciful to me. For my soul trusts in you. And in the shadow of your wings. Is that a beautiful image? In the shadow of your wings, I will make my refuge until these calamities have passed by. I will cry out to God most high, to God who performs all things for me. He shall send from heaven and save me. He reproaches the one who would swallow me up. In other words, he says, I'll take care. God will take care of my enemies. And the word Selah, anybody know for sure what Selah means? It, it some people think it's just a musical pause. Others say that it means pause and what? Think on this. Think about this. 
So back up when you see Selah and read it again. He shall send from heaven and save me, and he reproaches the one who would swallow me up. And then David says, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It's like he's saying amen to his own song right there. Amen. God's on my side. God shall send forth his mercy and his truth. Now listen to this. My soul is among lions. You can almost hear them prowling outside the cave. My soul is among lions. I lie among the sons of men who are set on fire, whose teeth are spears and arrows, dangerous people, and their tongue a sharp sword. And then he turns his focus from them to God. He says, yeah, they're, they're, they're more than me. They're, they're more in number than me. They're mightier than I am. They're fierce. They're dangerous people. And then he says, be exalted, O God. In other words, be higher than them. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens, and let your glory be over all the earth. They have prepared a net for my steps, and my soul is bowed down. I think it's so important to be honest when you pray. And that's why when I read David, I said, yeah, I felt that way too. David is just being honest with how he feels. He said, my soul is like I've been crushed. My soul is bowed down, and they've dug a pit before me. Into the midst of it, they themselves have fallen. He said, I'm down, but they're down even further than me. And God, you've done that. And he says, Selah, think about that. But verse 7, would you read verse 7 and 8 with me? My heart is steadfast, O God. My heart is steadfast. I will sing and give praise. Awake, my glory. Awake, lute and harp. I will awaken the dawn. David is ready to sing out loud in that cave, if he's still in the cave. He's ready to, don't care who's at the door, I'm going to give God my praise. I will praise him. I will sing to him. I will glorify him. I, I, I will lift and I'll grab my instrument, the harp that I play and the lute that I play, and I will awaken the dawn. I'll be the rooster that gets up before the sun even gets up. And I will praise you, O Lord, verse 9, among the peoples. I will sing to you among the nations, for your mercy reaches unto the heavens and your truth under the clouds. So be exalted, O God, above the heavens, and let your glory be over all the earth. And where is he when he says that? He's where you've, he is where you have been, and maybe where you are. He's in a cave. Lions, sharp-toothed lions, prowling, looking for him, <laughs> sniffing for him. And he's hidden away, and he says, you be exalted, O God, above the heavens, and let your glory be over all the earth. Some repetition here. But, but as you work on your will, go into Psalm 57. And he says, I will take refuge in you, Lord. I am, how do you do that? Well, you tell him, I'm taking refuge in you. And what else do you do? Be still. Be still. And say, God, I'm trusting you. And trust him. I will take refuge in you. I will not look to any man to be my refuge, to be my shelter, to be my strong tower, and I will cry out to God. Lord, you're going to hear my voice. I, I won't be silent about this. I am going to articulate it the best way that I can, honestly, about how I feel and where I'm at and the dangers that surround me and the fact that, yeah, I'm trembling with fear. That's why I say I won't be afraid. I have to call myself away from that fear, but I will cry out to you, and he says, I will praise you and sing to you, and then I love this next one, I will praise you publicly. But does that mean you, you walk into your favorite caffeine store and you sing them a hymn before you order your decaf latte? <laughs> no, that means when you get an opportunity, you speak highly of God. When everybody else right now, I, I, I wonder, how many of you at the office or in your circuit as you uh, rub shoulders with friends and, and neighbors. The talk went to Orlando in the last couple of days. Let me see just the hands of those who said, yeah, it came up. And I wonder what your words were in the midst of that. I'm going to praise God publicly. I'm going to praise you among the nations, he said, among the people. Well, why? Because they need to know there's still a, there still is the one true God that's in charge. And God doesn't get blamed for the evil that happened in Orlando. But his people need to lift up his praise and praise him 
publicly. It doesn't mean take your ukulele in there and play them a few bars. Praise is just that speaking highly of Christ, speaking highly of God and saying, you know what, right at this moment, I'm praying for the folks back there. I'm praying for the families that lost loved ones. I'm praying for the, the I'm, I'm sure that the story about the alligator came up. I'm, I'm praying for the Graves family. I'm just praying that God would comfort them. And maybe you can even add to that this, something like this, because God comforted me in a time of just unbelievable loss where I thought I'd never get over it. I never thought I'd never get past it. I thought I'd be in that cave forever. And you get to lift up that name of Jesus. You get to praise him even among the people. You get to praise him and to his face, and you get to praise him publicly. So I want to encourage you tonight. I'm going to ask Shannon and and uh, Michelle to come back up and uh, lead us in, in some, some worship as we close. But I want to encourage you tonight to work on your will in, in all of these ways, to work on your will to give God praise, to work on your will to trust Him, to work on your will. I will not fear. I will render you praise. I will walk with you, Lord when I don't understand you and I will cry out to you and I'll hide under the shadow and the shelter of your wings and I will rest right there and I will be still because you know you haven't had your you you have listen carefully it's not complicated I don't say carefully because it's complicated but because it's important you haven't had your last valley you haven't sailed through your last storm and so work on your will tonight. And he, you know what? Even if it's like, like Paul speaks about in, in uh, his letters, even if that, that voicing of, of your need to God is no more than a groan, he'll interpret that groaning. He knows what you mean when you don't have the words to say what you mean and say what you feel. But work on your will because you've got more fire, you've got more floods, and so do I. And you've got more peaks more wonderful peaks where God shows up in a, in a mighty way. And so let's work on that will. And let's make it strong in prayer. Pray through the Psalms. Make them your Psalms. Say, David, thanks for writing it. Now it's mine. Now it's mine. So Father God, I just pray that you would, would help us, Lord. Assist us. Only by your grace can we do this, Lord. Catch our attention when we're ready to be afraid when we're ready to run to the bank for refuge or we're ready to run one way or the other for help, grab our attention, Lord, and remind us, Father, to come to you, to not fear and to take refuge and to praise you to your face and to praise you publicly, Lord. We will. We will, Lord. Oh, God, just minister to your people now as we come to you in our praise. Thank you, Father. I want to sing that you're good one more time, but I want to ask you to close your eyes for just a second. I'm going to run through the list of our will. I'm going to just list those phrases and grab the one that most speaks to your heart as the will that you need to set in place tonight. And before we sing that again, you are good, good, so good. I want to ask you to voice this to God and say to him either, I will trust you, or I will praise your word or I will not fear or I will render you praise I'll paint you a portrait of praise or I will walk with you God one of these is going to hit I will take refuge in you Lord. I will cry out to you and maybe even with tears I will cry out to you and I will praise you and I will praise you publicly Speak one of those to God right now, the one that most fits your heart at this moment. Speak it out to him before we tell him again, he is good, he is good. Go ahead, just lift that to him. Oh God, I will take refuge in you. I will take shelter and refuge in you, Lord, in the stress of life. I will find refuge. Amen. Selah, Selah. Think about that. Think about that. Think about that. Find a prayer partner tonight or tomorrow, but no later than tomorrow. Contact somebody and say, do you want to pray? Do you want to pray with me? And if somebody asks you, you better say yes, okay? If they say, no, I'm too busy, someone else will say yes. So find somebody and, and declare that he is faithful in the storm. He's your shelter, amen? He's a captain through the storm. He's good, amen? 
Grace and peace to you. God bless you. This has been a presentation of Refuge Calvary Chapel Huntington Beach with Pastor Bill Welsh. For more information about our ministry, please visit refugefamily.com or call 714-891-9495.